Okay, so we're going to do a recap of the layers of the small and large intestine before we get into ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Uh, this is just to rehash what you have already learned in anatomy and physiology. So when you look at the layers of the small intestine, uh, you can see that uh, you have uh, different layers. You have the, the serosa, you have the muscularis, the submucosa, and then you see those finger-like projections at the top called the villi. And remember, the villi is what helps uh, with nutrient absorption in the small intestine. And remember when we were talking about celiac disease, that becomes destroyed when the patient uh, consumes gluten. So it destroys that villi that you see that finger-like projection sticking up. So that uh, is, in essence, the layers of the small intestine. And we're going to take a look at the large intestine next. So here are the layers of the colon, aka the large intestine. And again, you can see the serosa, the muscularis, you can see the submucosa, and the mucosa layer. So uh, it just shows you the inside uh, of the lumen of the large intestine. So when we're talking about ulcerative colitis and we're talking about uh, Crohn's disease, and it's talking about what layers are um, affected by these disease processes, uh, you will know what we are talking about based on looking at these layers of the small and large intestine. Okay, so first off, we're going to be talking about uh, ulcerative colitis. First, let's talk about inflammatory bowel diseases, which um, as these are categorized as. So ulcerative colitis, sometimes referred to as UC, and Crohn's disease are chronic episodic inflammatory bowel diseases that uh, afflicts young adults. The cause is unknown. There are theories. Uh, we don't memorize theories. So some of those theories, just to talk about them, are genetically related, uh, environmental, and they believe things like bacterias and immunological factors uh, are triggers for these um, bowel diseases. Psychosomatic disorders. Uh, we'll talk more about psychosomatic disorders when we get into mental health. A psychosomatic disorder is just a physical disorder that's caused by a, emotional factors, okay? So the thing to remember with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease is that these diseases are characterized by exacerbations and remissions. And we already talked about uh, what exacerbations and remissions are. Remember, an exacerbation is an increase in the severity of symptoms. Remissions, we have a decrease in symptom severity. So uh, UC and Crohn's have some very common features, and sometimes they cannot be differentiated at, at, you know, at different times when they are trying to diagnose one or the other, so keep that in mind. Okay, so with ulcerative colitis, you have an ulceration okay, of the mucosa and the submucosa of the colon. Okay, it is a disease of the colon and rectum. Uh, it usually begins in the rectum and then moves toward uh, the cecum. And if you do not remember where the cecum is, make sure that you go back and you look at where the cecum is located. You should have learned that in anatomy and physiology. So inflammation and ulcerations occur in the mucosal layer of that bowel wall. Okay, so it's in, again, the mucosa and submucosa of the colon. Uh, capillaries become very friable. Friable means brittle. They bleed. And this causes the patient's diarrhea to contain blood and pus. And it's very, very important that you remember the clinical manifestations of the color of the stools associated with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Okay, so uh, we've already said the diarrhea contains blood and pus. Um, pseudopolyps are common with ulcerative colitis, and we know polyps can become cancerous. Okay, uh, with healing and scar tissue formation, the colon's elasticity is lost. And when the elasticity is lost, its absorptive capabilities are lost as well. So again, revisiting A and P, you learn that the colon absorbs water and electrolytes. Okay, so that's its main role. So let's talk about the clinical manifestations associated with ulcerative colitis. And you better make sure that you know these. They're very important, okay? So what does the diarrhea look like with ulcerative colitis? The diarrhea has mucus, pus, and blood, okay? 
And this is one of the differentiations with uh, blood, okay? With ulcerative colitis, how I remember that blood is in ulcerative colitis patients' bowel movements is UC stands for ulcerative colitis. You remember it by UC blood, okay, in their stool. So with ulcerative colitis, we take the acronym, the two uh, letters of each one of those words, ulcerative and colitis, and say UC blood, okay, with the stool in patients who have ulcerative colitis. So that diarrhea, we also see mucus, pus also. So we see mucus, pus, and blood in the diarrhea of ulcerative colitis patients. One thing to remember with ulcerative colitis patients is they can have up to 20 stools per day. So bowel movements consume their life, okay? They have abdominal cramping. Uh, they have sometimes involuntary leakage of stool, and that's due to that scarring that has occurred within the bowel. With severe diarrhea, uh, you have sodium, potassium, uh, calcium loss that occurs. Some of the complications associated with ulcerative colitis include things like bleeding. Uh, you can have rupture of the bowel, uh, severe abdominal bloating. You can have, uh, your patients can have something that is called a toxic megacolon. Um, it is very dangerous. This is when the bowel becomes very distended and as that bowel becomes very distended, it becomes very thin. Okay, just think about when you blow up a balloon. A balloon becomes very thin when you start putting air into it. So the same thing with the bowel here. It becomes distended and thin. And the problem there is, just like with a balloon, when you put enough air into a balloon, it can pop. So with toxic megacolon, the bowel is very distended, it is thin, and it can perforate at any time. Okay, so it can perforate at any time, and that's something that we have to remember, okay? All right, so um, clinical manifestations of megacolon include fever, abdominal pain, severe distension, and our patient can go into shock, especially if there is perforation of the bowel. Now, one thing that is very important to remember, and this has been on people's NCLEX before, is that when a patient has ulcerative colitis, they have an increased risk of colon cancer, okay? So not only do you see blood in their stool, but you also see, you see colon cancer, okay? So you see blood in the stool, and that's a differentiation between you see uh, and Crohn's disease, you see blood in the stool and you see colon cancer uh, risks increase with our patients who have ulcerative colitis. Now during my assessment subjectively, my patient might tell me they're having rectal bleeding, cramping, they feel very lethargic, they have uh, lots of feelings of frustration, and they feel like they have a loss of control in their life because of all the pain, the cramping, and the unpredictability of their bowel movements. Okay, a person who has ulcerative colitis has to strategically plan all day long where the nearest commode is, okay, because of the unpredictability of these bowel movements. Again, we said they can have up to 20 a day. Uh, objective data, weight loss, distension, I can see those things with my vital signs. I see tachycardia, fever, leukocytosis, uh, leukocytosis is our increased white count. I'm going to observe for stool frequency and the characteristics of the stool because I'm going to have to document on those. Diagnostically, uh, they can do barium enema studies of the intestines. Uh, they might do a sigmoidoscopy, a colonoscopy. They might do biopsies. They can test the stool, um, you know, for things like when we see melina, okay, that black tarry like stool containing blood. They might do x rays. They're going to do labs and check electrolyte levels and all those sorts of things. So moving on to medical management with ulcerative colitis, there are some different types of drug therapies. Okay, We're just going to talk about a few of these. Uh, sulfasalazine is an anti-inflammatory. Okay, Remember, we have inflammation in the colon going on. So sulfasalazine is an anti-inflammatory, and it's used for mild cases, uh, well, excuse me, mild to chronic uh, ulcerative colitis. Um, again, it affects the inflammatory response and it provides some antibacterial uh, activity as well. Uh, it is effective in maintaining clinical remission. Uh, some other drugs, uh, your book talks about uh, olsalazine, uh, mesalamine, things like that. These are all anti-inflammatories. Sometimes a patient may have to uh, take immune system suppressants. Again, um, things like cyclosporin, um, 
methotrexate, different things like that to try to suppress the immune system. Okay, uh, Corticosteroids may be given, which have anti-inflammatory properties with severe cases of inflammation with UC. Um, Antidiarrheals, okay, uh, loperamide, things like that are used to treat the cramping and diarrhea associated with ulcerative colitis. Uh, nutritional therapy, um, make sure that we set up our patient with a dietary consult with the nutritionist. The goals are to provide adequate nutrition without making their symptoms worse. We need to correct and prevent malnutrition, uh, effectively replacing fluid and electrolytes, uh, trying to prevent weight loss, um, a well-balanced diet, that is important. We need to make sure that we promote a well-balanced diet with uh, sufficient calories, proteins, and nutrients. We can use the uh, MyPlate guidelines. Uh, that's beneficial so they get the proper amounts of fruits, grains, vegetables, dairy, um, things like that. Uh, the diet for each patient is going to be individualized. And again, this is why we need to have a dietary consult for our patients. Patients with diarrhea, this is one thing we have to think about. They tend to decrease their oral intake because they're trying to decrease their episodes of diarrhea, and this is not good. So patients who have uh, ulcerative colitis really tend to decrease their oral intake in order to decrease diarrhea. So uh, anorexia uh, can occur um, associated with the uh, inflammation also. And uh, you know, again, they try to decrease their oral intake of uh, fluid and food, so we see these patients become emaciated. Uh, blood loss also can lead to iron deficiency anemia. Uh, patients need to keep a food diary, okay? A food diary helps our patients to maybe be able to identify trigger foods that can cause their ulcerative colitis to exacerbate. Uh, many patients find out that they are actually lactose intolerant and their condition improves by avoiding milk products. Now, the following information right here in regards to nutrition is extremely important, and you better make sure that you know this following information, okay? So, high-fat foods trigger diarrhea, okay? So, high-fat foods are going to trigger diarrhea in my patients. Cold, okay, and high-fiber foods can also increase GI transit, okay? Cold foods can actually irritate the bowel, so we want to... Uh, have our patients avoid cold foods. Now, high fiber foods can actually stimulate the bowel and cause more diarrhea. So there is a fine line between uh, adequate fiber intake and too much fiber intake. So our patient needs to have a low fiber diet that is better. Because again, too much fiber in foods can actually stimulate the bowel and cause diarrhea. Okay, so again, avoiding cold foods, avoiding high fat foods, this patient needs to have a low fiber diet. Again, too much high fiber can stimulate diarrhea. Uh, smoking, we need to stop the smoking. That increases the motility in the intestines and that needs to be avoided. Uh, some patients uh, may need to be on TPN, okay, due to their fluid and electrolyte losses and due to malabsorption, okay? So that is some very important information with our ulcerative colitis patients. High fat foods trigger diarrhea. We do not want high fat foods in their diet. Cold foods can irritate the bowel. That's a no-no. High fiber foods can be a no-no. It stimulates the bowel and can cause diarrhea. So low fiber diet is better. Smoking cessation. We've got to stop the smoking. It needs to be avoided. Can increase the problems. And again, a lot of these patients uh, may need to be on TPN due to their uh, malabsorption uh, problems and the fluid and electrolyte losses. Okay, so that's very important to remember that information right there. Stress control. Ulcerative colitis can be aggravated by stress. So we need to identify factors that is causing stress to help control this disease process. Our patient needs to develop coping mechanisms. Okay, and again, coping mechanisms is something we will talk more about when we get into the mental health chapter. Surgical interventions. Okay, you have uh, some surgical interventions that are listed in your book, okay? So as you are going through this chapter following uh, my notes, let's take a look at a box that is called Surgical Interventions for Ulcerative Colitis. It's in a blue box, and it's at the top of the page on the left-hand side. 
So let's look first off at what is called a colon resection. So these are some of the things my patients with UC may have to undergo. So a colon resection is removal of a portion of the large intestine and we have anastomosis of the remaining segment. So they're just gonna go in with the large intestine, they're gonna take out the problem area, and they're gonna simply reattach the large intestine after they remove the problem area. And again, anastomosis, we just have reattachment. Okay, that's what anastomosis means. All right, let's, the next bullet, an ilioanal anastomosis. This is where they remove the colon um, and the rectum, but they leave the anus intact, along with the anal sphincter. Anastomosis is formed between the lower end okay, of the small intestine and the anus. So that's what they will reattach. They'll reattach the lower end of the small intestine to the anus. An ileostomy uh, is a surgical formation of an opening of the ileum onto the surface of the abdomen. Okay? So uh, with an ileostomy, they are going to have a stoma in which fecal matter is emptied. Okay, the next one is called a coke pouch, okay, or a coke continent ileostomy, so a coke pouch. This is the surgical removal of the rectum and colon, okay, uh, with formation of a reservoir by suturing loops of the ileum together to form a pouch, okay, that's underneath the skin. It'll have um, a nipple valve and also a stoma. So a catheter, when you look at the picture of the coke pouch, again, they have taken pieces of the ileum. They have sutured the ileum, which is part of the small intestine. They have taken segments, uh, they have sewn it together, and they have made a reservoir, a pouch right there for stool, okay? So that is what a coke pouch is because they have removed the rectum and the colon. So we've got to have another way for, for waste material to get out of the body. So with a coke pouch, uh, your book doesn't say this, but how it works is a catheter is actually inserted uh, into that to drain the waste, and that waste is going to be liquid. Okay, so that's why it can be uh, that's why that they can insert a catheter in there and drain the waste because it is liquid. Uh, it's not solid like when it comes uh, out from the colon. Okay, so again, they can just insert a catheter into there and drain out the liquid stool. Uh, proctocolectomy is the removal of the anus, the rectum, and the colon. Okay, and ileostomy is established for the removal of, of course, waste products. So those are some surgical interventions for ulcerative colitis that you can take a look at. And then again, your picture there in the figure underneath it actually shows you anatomically uh, what a coke pouch looks like. Okay. All right. So let's see, next we're going to talk about nursing interventions for my ulcerative colitis patient. So thorough assessments of patient's bowel elimination, their support systems, their coping mechanisms, uh, their nutritional status, pain, and their understanding of the disease uh, is very important you know, to make sure that you have assessed all these different areas and you have answered any questions that come up. Prevention. Okay, prevention of future episodes, that is the goal. Pre-op care is going to include um, a stoma site selection. Okay, so we've, they, we've got to select a place that the stoma is going to be. And again, all a stoma is is where a part of the intestine is brought up uh, to the surface um, of, the ab ab of the abdomen in different areas. And uh, that is how we, the body is, uh, gets rid of stool. So that is what all a stoma is. Now, also, other than stoma site selection with our pre-op care, we're going to have to perform additional diagnostic tests if cancer is suspected. Also, we're going to have to aid the patient in accepting the fact that their previous treatments were unsuccessful because they might have depression over this. Okay, we've just got to help them accept that other treatment modes were not successful, and this is what, you know, what they're facing right now is um, the prospect of a stoma. Prepare the patient, um, uh, prepare them uh, for their surgery. So we've got to prepare the bowel. Uh, the bowel is prepared for two to three days pre-op uh, with like a bland to clear diet. So you just follow your orders. And then uh, bowel preps will be used and laxatives. Now antibiotics, this is extremely important and we've already talked about this in the surgical chapter. Okay, antibiotics such as erythromycin, 
and neomycin, um, sometimes they are administered to decrease that bacterial count in the bowel. Okay, again, erythromycin and neomycin are antibiotics that are administered uh, before the surgery to decrease the bacterial count in the bowel. Okay, so that is something that may be done also pre-op, and that's very important to remember. Post-op nursing interventions depends on the type of the procedure and the patient's response. Areas of concern are bowel and urinary elimination, fluid and electrolyte balances, tissue perfusion, pain, uh, gas exchange, infection, and of course assessment of the ileostomy and the peristomal skin. So the skin around the stoma is something we're going to have to pay very close attention to because it can become very um, excoriated. You know, if liquid stool gets on the surface of the skin, it is very caustic to the skin and can cause the skin to break down. So that's why we have to be assessing that peristomal skin. Uh, patient problems, your book talks about potential for impaired coping. I mean, think about it. If you were told that you're going to have to have uh, an ileostomy and you are not going to be able to have regular bowel movements on a commode anymore, that you are now going to have to, if you had a coke pouch, for example, you are now going to be draining liquid stool from um, a, a coke pouch, okay? Think about how that would affect you psychologically. So impaired coping is something we really have to consider as a nurse. Uh, impairments in their self-esteem, okay? A distorted body image. You know, a lot of patients sit and think, you know, gosh, I'm going to look so disgusting now because I have this stoma here. And, oh, my gosh, what is my, uh, my husband or my wife? What are they going to think of me with this? It, you know, I think it's disgusting. You know, patients think things like that, and it can lead to depression. So we as nurses have to intervene whenever we detect, like, distorted body images, impairments in my patient's self-esteem. Okay? We have to be watching for those things as nurses. Nursing uh, interventions um, also include reinforcing the physician's explanations of the procedure and the outcomes, uh, providing reading material and demonstration of ostomy pouch care when the patient is ready, and that helps to decrease their anxiety. Maybe a visit. Someone comes from the United Ostomy Association, and they can provide hope to that patient. You know, they can say, hey, um, a year ago, I was you. You know, the same thing happened to me with my ulcerative colitis. I had to have a coat pouch, you know, and they can talk to them. There is no better person for a patient to talk to than someone who has walked in their shoes, okay? Uh, we as nurses can talk about things all day long with them, okay? But really what helps a patient uh, psychologically is to talk to someone who has actually walked in their shoes and can relate to them, okay? So do not expect immediate acceptance of a stoma. It's gonna be a gradual thing. Uh, be supportive. Encourage your patient to share their fears, okay? Because their fears are very real. Um, make, you, make sure that you assess that peristomal skin, the skin around the stoma for uh, impaired skin integrity. Um, also, allergies can occur in patients that are allergic to the pouches that are used, uh, the adhesives, the skin barriers, the pastes that are used. They can have allergic reactions to those things. So the skin might start to look very erythematous. It starts to break down and erode. It can bleed. So we need to uh, intervene and change the type of pouch, uh, the tape, or the adhesive to help resolve the problem. Um, mechanical trauma can also occur uh, due to friction or the stripping of the adhesive around the stoma. Uh, so we can avoid this by changing the pouch maybe less often, um, using uh, adhesive tape more sparingly, and uh, use uh, skin prep solutions, okay? Uh, chemical irritants are commonly a big problem, and that the chemical irritant that we're talking about is stool, okay, stool that is seeping from the stoma. So we need to make sure that our patient has proper skin barriers, okay? A common infection that occurs in that peristomal skin is uh, Candida albicans that we've already talked about, okay, that fungal infection that's caused by yeasts. Uh, we see this commonly in people who have been taking antibiotics for five or more days. Uh, we can treat this and help to uh, 
help our patient with this by using nystatin powder. Uh, that is an antifungal, okay? So nystatin can be used. Um, patient teaching, teach the patient or the caregiver the appropriate ileostomy or colostomy care uh, to foster independence. Uh, this includes uh, changing the pouch, cleansing, irrigation, if necessary, and skin care. Provide them with a list of foods that can cause constipation or diarrhea or blockages or increased flatulence and odor. Uh, prior to discharge, provide a list of resources, okay, um, of people they can contact, phone numbers, phone numbers of a supply, you know, of a supplier who can supply them with their uh, pouches and their adhesives and their skin barriers and all those things. So giving them phone numbers and resources to people like that and where they can purchase them is very helpful to my patient. Okay, uh, let's take a look um, at the huge blue box. Uh, you have, it's called post-operative nursing interventions for ulcerative colitis. Okay, and it's a, got 13 items in it and we're gonna kind of briefly go through these. So number one, monitor your NG suction for patency until bowel function is resumed. Maintain correct wall suctioning. Uh, accurately make sure you record the color and the amount of output. Irrigate the NG tube as needed. Um, apply water-soluble lubricant to the nares. Again, the nares can break down from the pressure of the tube. Assess bowel sounds. Okay, that's important. Uh, make sure you assess those bowel sounds with the uh, NG suctioning turned off, okay, when you're auscultating and listening. Uh, that's important, and always make sure you remember to turn it back on. Initiate ostomy care and teaching when bowel activity begins. Observe the stoma. The stoma, again, that's an artificial, uh, an artificial opening of an internal organ to the body's surface. I'm looking at that stoma for things like color uh, and the size of the stoma. The stoma should look pinkish, reddish in color. It might look slightly edematous. That is normal. Even after surgery, a slight amount of bleeding is normal, okay? Document your assessment. For example, stoma pink and viable. Viable means it's alive, it is living, okay? If it looks black and necrosed, you know it's not alive and living. The stoma uh, is dead, okay? So you're looking for those things and documenting that. Select the appropriate pouching system, okay? Um, talks about that, and I know you all went over uh, stomas and how to put on um, the bags and things like that in, the first, in your first term. So um, it talks about the pouch opening no more than uh, 1 16th of an inch larger than the stoma. The stomas uh, change in size over time, so the stoma will change in size, and it should be measured before new supplies are ordered so they don't waste their money. Number five, empty the pouch when it's about one-third to one-half full to prevent it from breaking the seal, okay? And then they have stool leakage all over, all, all over the patient. So we have to be mindful of that. That, you know, for a patient that is laying there and has stool all over them, that's embarrassing for them. So we've got to always keep in mind about their body image, okay? Uh, number six, explain the, that initial dark green liquid will change to a yellowish brown as they're allowed to eat. Uh, seven, teach the patient to care for the stoma. Okay, that, this includes having the patient look at the stoma, gradually assist with emptying, cleansing, and changing the pouch. Uh, teach the patient that normal grieving occurs after loss of rectal function, so be supportive okay, of your patient. Number eight, promote independence and self-care. Number nine, instruct on follow-up home care, including changing a uh, skin barrier, okay, things like that every five to seven days. That's important, using antacids, uh, skin protective paste and liquid skin barriers may be appropriate if we have excoriation occurring around the stoma. Uh, let's see here, number 10, the patient may shower or bathe with or without the pouch on. That is up to them. Our patients need to have some autonomy in their life, so that is up to them. Um, number 11, patients should avoid lifting objects heavier than 10 pounds until the uh, healthcare provider says uh, otherwise. Number 12, a special diet is not necessary, but patients should drink about 8 to 10 glasses of water a day. Okay, they need to chew their food very well. 
and they need to limit or avoid certain gas forming foods. Some examples of gas forming foods, if you want to jot them down, include things like onions, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, carbonated beverages. Okay, so I'll say those again, some of the gas forming foods they might need to limit or avoid onions, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and carbonated beverages. All right, number 13, sexual relationships can be resumed when the healthcare provider feels it is not harmful to the surgical site. Counseling, um, that might be appropriate if the patient has a fear of resuming this activity. Again, this patient is going to be going through a grieving process. Sometimes patients suffer from depression. So we as nurses need to pick up on that and make sure they get the proper psych services that they need. Next, we're moving on to Crohn's disease. Um, with ulcerative colitis, you know, uh, they believe ulcerative colitis has, of course, autoimmune uh, properties to it. There is also debate as to whether Crohn's disease uh, is in fact an autoimmune disorder as well. I have read some research where doctors say it's not. I have read some research where they say that it is. So um, we'll let them argue about it. Um, what we're going to worry about is that Crohn's disease uh, is inflammation of the bowel wall, okay? So we have inflammation of the bowel wall. You have inflammation of segments of the GI tract. The cause is unknown. Again, there is strong association with altered immune mechanisms, uh, genetic and environmental factors. It commonly occurs during, uh, when we think about Crohn's disease, it commonly uh, occurs during adolescence and early adulthood. Um, also in people in uh, ages 50 to 60, it tends to uh, increase during that time, uh, time of age also. Crohn's can occur anywhere in the GI tract. Okay, so anywhere in the GI tract, Crohn's can occur. Now commonly, commonly, it occurs in the terminal ileum and the proximal colon. So if you have forgotten where that is located, make sure that you look up some pictures and figure out where is the terminal, the terminal ileum and the proximal colon. So we tend to see it commonly occur there in those areas. Now one thing to remember about Crohn's disease is that inflammation involves all the layers of the bowel wall. So all the layers. Of the bowel wall. So um, that is something too important to remember with the disease process of Crohn's. It's an involving all the layers of the bowel wall. Uh, the mucosa, one thing that is uh, that sticks out with Crohn's disease is that the mucosa uh, starts to take on like a cobblestone appearance due to the pattern of the ulceration. So it looks like a cobblestone appearance with Crohn's disease. Now, inflammation, uh, fibrosis, which is just the formation of fibrous tissue, you have scarring uh, that occurs um, with the whole entire thickness of the intestines. Uh, patients are likely to have bowel obstructions. They can have fistulas, which is that abnormal uh, opening between two organs or between an organ and the opening of um, the skin surface. They can also have fissures, which are cracks. They can have abscesses, okay? So they can have pus with swelling and inflammation. <clears throat> now, some major problems with Crohn's, okay, that we have to think about is uh, we have a lot of malabsorption when the small intestine is involved, okay? So we have a lot of malabsorption when we have involvement of the small intestine. We have lots of nutritional deficits that occur with Crohn's. Pernicious anemia, Okay, due to that decreased absorption of vitamin B12 in the small intestine. We have fluid and electrolyte imbalances that occur. Sodium and potassium depletion uh, related to the diarrhea. Okay, so, so that's important to think about. Now, what are my clinical manifestations that I'm going to see? Well, that's going to depend on the site of the Crohn's disease and the extent of the disease process and any complications that the patient may have. The thing about Crohn's disease is that its onset is insidious, which just means subtle. Uh, they may have complaints of diarrhea, fatigue, abdominal pain, weight loss, fever, things like that. 
So we have we have to take those into account with our clinical manifestations. Uh, with progression, there is a lot of weight loss in some of the patients. Again, dehydration occurs, malnutrition, electrolyte imbalances occur, um, anemia, and of course, increased peristalsis can occur as well. So with that, with the Crohn's disease, uh, remember uh, with the uh, diarrhea, the diarrhea associated uh, with Crohn's disease is not going to be uh, as frequent as it is with our patients who have ulcerative colitis. Remember, their bowel movements can uh, be as many as 15 to 20 a day. And thank goodness for the Crohn's disease patient, their uh, diarrhea is usually about maybe three or four times a day. But uh, during our assessment subjectively, uh, the patient's going to complain of weakness, they don't have a lot of an appetite, they have abdominal pain, cramping, maybe a low-grade fever, uh, sleeplessness related to diarrhea and stress, right lower quadrant pain. Okay, that is, that is a cardinal sign of Crohn's disease, right lower quadrant pain and tenderness. Now, why right lower quadrant pain and tenderness? Well, we already said that Crohn's disease typically uh, occurs a lot of the time uh, at the terminal ileum and at the proximal colon location. And that is anatomically where, the, where these areas are located is in the right lower quadrant. So it makes sense that with Crohn's disease, the patients are going to complain of a lot of pain and tenderness uh, in that right lower quadrant. Now, objectively, our patient's going to have diarrhea. Uh, talks about up to four semi-solid semi stools daily uh, with mucus and pus, but no blood usually, okay? It is not always present. So again, remember when we talked about ulcerative colitis, I told you, you see blood, okay? With Crohn's disease, we have the mucus and the pus, but no blood. That's important for you to remember, okay? Uh, Statorrhea occurs, which is just excess fat in the feces. Our patients are having weight loss. They might have strictures where we have that abnormal narrowing in the intestines. They can have obstructions from scar tissue. Uh, they can have intestinal fistulas that can occur. Um, watery stools, fever, anemia, uh, things like that. Now, diagnostic tests, uh, colonoscopy, they're going to do biopsies of the colon and the terminal ileum. They're going to do blood tests uh, to check for anemia. They might also do uh, the capsule endoscopy, which we talked about at the beginning of the chapter. Medical management, <clears throat> medications, okay? Treatment is going to be individualized, and it's going to depend upon the patient's age, the location of the disease, the severity, and any complications. So those with mild to moderate disease, uh, they'll be taking anti-inflammatories such as what we've already talked about, the sulfasalazine, okay, the mesalamine, things like that. Those with severe inflammation, uh, they take things like prednisone. Uh, multivitamins and B12 injections are necessary. If these first line of therapies fail, like if the anti-inflammatories like the sulfasalazine or prednisone or whatever, if these first lines of therapy fail, then they're going to have to initiate a second line of therapies. Uh, and these are going to be our immunosuppressant therapies, uh, such as um, azathioprine okay, and cyclosporin, things like that. All right, uh, there is a drug called infliximab that is extremely important for you to remember. Infliximab is an immunosuppressant, and it is specifically used for the treatment of Crohn's disease. Okay, so that's very important for you to remember. Infliximab is an immunosuppressant that is specifically used for the treatment of Crohn's disease. We're going to have dietary intervention, stress reduction, surgery. All these are used in the management of Crohn's. Now with the diet, we are going to do an exclusion of things like lactose-containing foods, um, if the patient is lactose intolerant. Uh, also, gas-causing vegetables like our cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, things like that. So we're going to exclude those. Uh, also, caffeine, uh, beer, MSG. Okay, MSG is um, a flavor enhancer. Uh, sorbitol, which is found in sugar-free gums and mints and things like that. 
um, highly seasoned foods, concentrated fruit juices, carbonated beverages, uh, fatty foods. So we're going to have to do an exclusion of a lot of these things. The diet, uh, diet high, high in protein, that is what is recommended. <clears throat> Again, small frequent meals, small frequent meals, increasing water intake. Okay, that's important to think about. If uh, my patient's symptoms are very severe, uh, they may have to be on TPN, okay, to allow the GI tract to rest. Some complications that can occur, uh, scarring, obstructions, fistulas, again, things like that can occur in our Crohn's patients. All right, so surgical treatment, surgical treatment. Uh, about three-fourths of um, patients with Crohn's are going to eventually require surgery. Uh, surgery does produce remission, but recurrence rates are very high. And usually surgical removal of uh, large segments of the small intestine can lead to something called short bowel syndrome. Okay, and with short bowel syndrome, this is where the absorptive surface is inadequate in the intestines to maintain life. Okay, so we have way too much of that absorptive surface that has been removed. And it's been removed so much that um, the patient cannot absorb nutrients correctly. Okay, so they cannot live because of too much of the bowel being removed and the bowel cannot uh, absorb, uh, it cannot absorb the proper nutrients uh, that we need to sustain life. So this patient may have to be, of course, on TPN. Uh, resection of the diseased bowel and anastomosis, uh, that is a possibility. Um, emergency surgery uh, is indicated if the person uh, has a perforation of the bowel and the contents of the bowel has spilled out into the abdominal cavity, that causes peritonitis, uh, which we'll talk about later. So the abdomen is going to have to be washed out, and the patient may have to have a temporary ostomy put in place. But hopefully, uh, you know, of course, it can be reversed, hopefully. Nursing interventions, TPM. Uh, tube feedings, okay? So that's some of the things we think about. Vitamin B12 supplements. Um, iron uh, dextrin can be given uh, with anemia. We know with iron, we give that by z track method, okay? That's where we pull the skin laterally or downward, um, and we do that because of the irritation and the staining of skin that iron can cause. Uh, oral diets need to replace the fluids that have been lost and the electrolytes due to diarrhea. Also, we need to monitor their weight and their skin condition. Uh, make sure we maintain an accurate I and O. Uh, also, let me backtrack on z track for just a minute. z track is also used, um, I about forgot to say this, to prevent the leakage of medication okay, into the subcutaneous tissue, and that can be very irritating as well. So it also prevents the leakage of medication into the subcutaneous tissue when we uh, use the z track method. So that's something also to keep in mind. Also, uh, make sure our patient has a bedside commode accessible. Um, empty the bedpans immediately and deodorize the room. There's nothing worse for a patient when they already feel bad and someone has, uh, they, they've got up, they've used their bedside commode and nobody bothers to empty it or clean it out. And they've got to lay there and uh, smell that odor. So be the good nurse and make sure those bedpans or those bedside commodes are uh, immediately emptied and deodorize the room. Have consideration for people. Always think about if this was somebody in your family laying here in the bed. Um, the anal region may become very excoriated, so we need to make sure we're assessing the anal region very uh, closely. Uh, we may need to keep it clean. Um, we might need to use medicated wipes such as tux. Uh, a sitz bath can be helpful, and I'll put a slide up of what it uh, looks like uh, when a patient has a sits, a sits bath. Um, also, these nursing interventions promote comfort and hygiene for our patients. We need to provide emotional support for our patients. Again, remember the onset of disease for Crohn's disease, the majority of the time occurs in adolescence and in early adulthood, people are struck with Crohn's disease. Uh, support groups can help our patients. Uh, possibly, uh, it might be necessary for antidepressants for this patient or psych services, okay? So always think about the psych side of your nursing. Patient teaching, 
Help the patient to understand how diarrhea and rapid emptying of the small intestine affects their nutritional status, uh, which will lead to uh, acceptance of these special diets that they're going to have to be on. Um, and that also helps them to retain a sense of control over the disease. Also identify resources for emotional support. Okay, you have some patient problems that you need to make sure uh, that you look at. So be sure and look at those. You have two, you have helplessness, and then you have insufficient nutrition. So be sure and read over those. Those are uh, very important. 